Hi guys, it's Mark Zikri, writer of Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine and many other TV shows, and also Mark Zikri of Space Command, and also known as Mr. Sci-Fi. And subscribe to the Mr. Sci-Fi YouTube channel if you haven't already. I'll be talking a lot about a lot of science fiction stuff, but today we are talking about Star Trek Discovery versus the Orville. A lot of the Mr. Sci-Fi fans have been asking me to talk about the Orville. And uh, so, uh, so at this stage, I'm in England. Uh, Elaine and I have been working on a feature for the last five weeks uh, that, that she's been hired to write and I've been hired on as a producer. Both of us are art producers on it along with two producers in the UK. So we've, I've been catching up with Star Trek Discovery and watching the Orville here in the UK. Interestingly enough, Star Trek Discovery is on Netflix, which I already subscribed to, so it's free here. Uh, for me, and the Orville, ironically, which would be free if I were watching it back home on Fox, I have to pay for it because it's not um, geographically available um, other than me buying it on Amazon UK and watching it that way. So, um, or Amazon.com, one of them. Anyway, I'm paying for it, so it's, a, it's I'm in Bizarro World. It's the reverse of what it would normally be, uh, paying for the Orville and getting uh, Star Trek Discovery for free. So let's talk about these two shows. I've watched four episodes of Discovery. I've watched two and a half of the Orville, so I'm sort of halfway through the, the one about the, the sex change for the, the egg that hatched and all of that stuff. Uh, okay, just, just to, to set a basic thing. Um, both shows are being done by people who have worked on Star Trek, various iterations of Star Trek. Brandon Braga uh, is on the Orville. VFX people who worked on Star Trek are on the Orville. Um, on, on, uh, on Star Trek Discovery. You know, Brian Fuller was one of the instigating uh, creative people on that. Uh, Nicholas Myers, a consulting producer, he did Wrath of Khan and other Star Trek iterations and so forth. So, so both teams consist of, and Andre Bormanis, I think, is on, I think he's on the Orville, he's on one of them. Um, uh, you know, these are both being done by people who love Star Trek. I mean, I've, I've seen, I saw a panel on Star Trek Discovery. I know where their hearts are at. Um, and the Orville clearly has enormous affection for, uh, for, for the Star Trek franchise. But they're very different. One is very much like a TV show back in the 90s. The other is very much like TV is done now. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So let me... Let me get into all this. And also, I'm, 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 I've been writing and directing and producing Space Command. Many of you know about this. We're in post-production on that. That's very much also a, a response to Star Trek and also to the TV shows of the current day. And, and personally, of the three, I prefer Space Command. And very soon, you'll be able to watch it, too, and come to your conclusions. I hope you, you like it as well. But it also stars Doug Jones, who stars in Star Trek Discovery. So that's a very interesting little uh, uh, cross-fertilization. So here we go. Uh, where to start? Here's the thing. Back in the 90s, and I wrote a lot of television in the 90s, basically most episodes were self-contained. That was a, a, a lineage from the early days of the TV where you would syndicate a show, they were shown, shown out of order, so they had to be basically... Um, Every episode had to be the same in terms of you could mix and match. So the first episode of Star Trek was the same as the 79th episode of Star Trek. You could show them in any order. And, uh, and, and they would begin and end within that episode, and they usually didn't carry over to another episode. So for instance, you know, Kirk's heart is broken by Edith Keeler in City on the Edge of Forever, but that's not something that's ever brought up again. And, 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 or, and, and you know, Spock is, is engaged, and, and he thinks he kills, kills Kirk in a muck time never comes up again. I mean, sometimes the, the mythology would build, but again, uh, whereas in TV now, it's all an arc, often episodes don't tell a story, self-contained story, etc. Um, so, so here, so I'll just give you my, my capsule comments on these two shows. Uh, st you know, The Orville is basically Seth MacFarlane's Star Trek The Next Generation. It's, it, it's, you know, legally, if you do a satire or something, that kind of gets you off the hook. But it's sort of, it's, it's funny in terms of it being a satire because it's half a satire and half not. It really is Star Trek The Next Generation, more or less. It's uh, the visual set, the sets, the, the ship, the everything, very Star Trek, the, the uniforms, and specifically Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, Paramount didn't sue, CBS didn't sue, uh, because I didn't think they wanted to take on Seth MacFarlane and Fox. It would just be a... A, a, you know, a disaster for them to do that. So they'll, they'll stomp all over the Star Trek fan films and stop those from happening uh, in the way they've done. And if you've been watching my, my posts on Axanar and Star Trek continues, Star Trek the next generation, uh, Star Trek uh, phase two slash 
um, Star Trek New Voyages. Those have all, you know, uh, shut down in one way or another or been extremely curtailed. Um, and uh, and so we, we can get into that on another video. But but with Seth MacFarlane's uh, The Orville, it, it the episodes tell us beginning, middle, and end kind of story. The characters have affection for each other. They're loyal to each other. Um, this is all very much, a, and it's an hour show, not a half hour comedy. It's an hour show. And basically, it's got pretty much a straightforward plot. And then they'll put kind of vulgar jokes here and there, a dog lock, licking its balls, you know, talking about prostates or, 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 you know, high colonics or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. And so where, wherever your sense of humor lies along that vulgarity scale will determine whether or not you find those jokes funny. And, um, but, um, but it's, it's an amiable show. And the story's like, okay, what, in one episode, the young, the young uh, officer learns to, to, you know, be a good leader. Or in another one, the character has a, you know, all-male race has a female child and it's dealing with gender issues. Or in another one, there's an age, uh, you know, um, a beam that causes time to accelerate and, and it's stolen and they have to, you know, it's, it's very much storylines that might have more or less been on Star Trek The Next Generation. They're not blazing new trails by any means. And... And, but the characters are very likable, and Seth MacFarlane's character is very likable. It's very fun that it's his ex-wife who's his, his um, second in command. That's a fun twist. And, um, but, you know, they did one with an alien zoo. They're throwing an alien zoo. Well, you know, these are, these are enormously um, cliche science fiction stories. I mean, that, Rod Serling did that back in 1959, that exact story. And, and at the end, they have, you know, reality TV is the solution. And, and although it's set, I think, in the 24th century or somewhere around then, you know, the jokes are very much 20th century jokes. So again, they're playing on these cliches and playing off of them. But, you know, the real question is how long will this be entertaining? Well, you know, they're doing a number of episodes. We're already up to episode six. Will it wear it out, out its welcome? It seems to be a hit. People seem to like it. That's fine. I'm, I, I have, don't, you know, again, these things are being done with affection and they're being, they're, and the guys, the people who are working on both of these shows are working extremely hard, but, 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 but it's very much, and if you look at the visual effects on the Orville, they're very much, they could have been dropped into um, Star Trek The Next Generation and, and it would have absolutely uh, fit right in. There's no, there's no lens flare, there's no, uh, they're, they're very clean. Everything is very, very, very clean, very sharp. And that's that's what visual effects looked like back then, and and so it's fine, it's okay, uh, but it's you know it's not thrilling. Uh, the, um, and just to put me in context, my favorite movie in the recent years is Mad Max Fury Road. It was terrific. It blazed a trail. It was fresh. It was different. It just it didn't just go over the old things that had been done in the Mad Max movies. It wasn't you know certain franchises like Alien or uh, the Terminator just are, are are repeating themselves and not finding new ground. They're just kind of Le uh, diminishing returns, whereas Mad Max Fury Road was terrific, uh, and and I very much like the new the new Blade Runner um, sequel as well. And I'll get to that. I'll do a new Mr. Sci-Fi commentary on that. But and in terms of TV, the the show I've liked best in recent years is Westworld. I thought it was terrific. Um, some people liked it, some people didn't. But I thought what it was doing structurally, what it was doing with character, uh, was really fresh and really interesting. And so that that puts me in context, my aesthetic. Um, let's talk about Star Trek Discovery. I've watched four episodes now. First two episodes were weak. Uh, second and, thir and uh, third and fourth episodes are better. But here's the problem. The, the way TV shows work now, shows like Breaking Bad, shows on and on, you can name every, almost every drama, characters are not, they're basically at each other's throats. Uh, the, 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 the most violent, uh, toughest, meanest, least honest person usually succeeds. Uh, and and it's a very and morality is basically the winner is the winner you know and maybe he'll care about his family maybe like in the Sopranos or maybe he'll or, or or Breaking Bad or or he'll have a friend that he's loyal to but essentially it's a dog eat dog world and it's a very dark vision and it's one that I I don't um, agree with or subscribe to because in the real world love and compassion are counterweights against evil and chaos and it's vital that we reach across barriers and boundaries. And, and create a hopeful future, a future worth living. And otherwise, you know, uh, what are we left with? So I think that the messages of some shows are extremely dubious. But so Star Trek Discovery, all the characters are each other at each other's throat, throats, nobody likes each other, where's loyalty, where's all of this stuff? You know, it's, I, I think it's a good show and I find it entertaining and kind of interesting. Uh, I think it looks great, it looks like a feature. I've heard that it's $8 million an episode, uh, which is a lot. Um, 
we could put it to put it in context to context an episode of Deep Space Nine would have been about two million an episode and Star Trek the Next Generation and Babylon Five God they never cracked a million per episode it started out around seven hundred thousand and change got up to about nine hundred thousand and change over a five year course and so um, it's a different world now but um, but with Star Trek Discovery the main character Michael she basically when we talk about being in a military structure and obeying orders and and following a chain of command and you know i mean for instance Worf and um you know and, and all the characters on star trek the next generation would they have would they have made mutiny would they have disobeyed she, i mean she disobeys at every turn i mean she she and you know again for those who haven't watched the shows don't listen to all this but and she mutinies in the first episode you know takes over the ship knocks out her commander then after being um you know, uh, convicted of mutiny, and then basically given a second chance, she breaks into a lab, she steals the breath uh, reading of another officer, which is again, very dubious technology, but she does that, breaks into a secret lab, gets the data, so she's all, you know, she doesn't take a second chance and they send, and say, I'll, I'll be an obedient crew member, she is immediately, anytime she encounters anything she personally disagrees with, she breaks orders, she disobeys orders, she's a lone wolf, and maybe that's where the show is going, uh, to, to, to teach her a lesson about that, but I don't think that's where it's going. I think it's basically her captain's going to prove, prove to be a, a disreputable sort, blah, 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 blah. She's going to, you know, free that bugbear thing or whatever. You know, uh, she's basically flying on her own code of ethics. She basically doesn't care what other people think. I, I, in the real world, would she last two minutes in the military? They say that she's been with that first Captain Michelle Gill for seven years. I don't believe a moment of that. Because she's so, um, she's, she's totally not like a military person in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, she'd be drummed out immediately. Um, so, so I have a problem with her. The, the only character I like that's likable is Tilly, uh, ever, you know, who's sort of, you know, the one who seems to have Asperger's whether or not she does. And but she's friendly, she's amiable, she's helpful, she's, you know, concerned, she's considerate. It's, um, you know, in, in Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Generation and so forth, these characters often... Had affection for each other. They cared about each other. They were they had friends, you know. And that seems to be something that is not part of the modern lexicon of TV shows, uh, dramas certainly. So, um, so I think we'll see where this goes. But it's really, if you look at the Orville and if you look at Star Trek Discovery, it's really almost like tree rings or generations, where ones in the '90s, ones in 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 2017, and they they are almost like. Um, flies in amber in that way and you can study the differences in how TV has worked and work is working now and um, you know and, and again also like you know and but also it's funny in, in the Orville they've got the character who's like Worf they've got a robot who's sort of like Data sounds like Data even though it is not Brent Spiner but it's a sound alike um, you know they ha they have you know so again whichever one you you like whichever one you find entertaining that's fine and I, I, I wish both of them well. I, I, I wish both of them success. They're definitely working hard. They're definitely creating shows of merit. Um, you know, but, um, but again, with, with, with Star Trek Discovery, um, you just wish people, the characters would start being warmer toward each other, helping each other, working with each other. Maybe that's where it's going. I think so far Doug Jones is basically doing Odo, um, more or less. I mean, you know, I, I love Doug, and he's my, my lead in, one of my leads in Space Command, so... Uh, he's incredibly talented, and I'm very eager to see what he does in Shape of Water. But um, but so far, I don't find that character fresh in terms of what, what Star Trek has done. Now, finally, uh, so we should talk about Space Command for a minute. Um, for those who have who don't know what Space Command is, you know, I've, I've been writing, directing, and producing this new show. And we shot the two-hour pilot, and we're in post-production on the, the VFX. If you go down any of the Mr. Sci-Fi... Um, uh, videos you can find the Space Command panels, the Space Command trailer, all that stuff, or you can go to spacecommandseries.com and see what my take on a new iteration of this kind of show would be. In in Space Command, the characters care about each other; they're ethical, they're honest, um, they they're creating a future worth living in. There are challenges, but but the whole point is look deeper, look better. You know, and again, in Star Trek Discovery, they have Klingons, and maybe they're going to show some a more human quote unquote quote unquote quote unquote face of Klingons but at the same time in the th in the fourth episode they're talking about how they ate Michelle Yeoh they they ate her and he's like I don't remember the Klingons eating th their enemies so that's kind of strange um but um but again we'll see where it goes but I'm again Klingons are you know I really don't care about Klingons I don't I'm not interested in where Klingons are going and the, the other part of it by the way is 
you know, you don't really have to live everything you write about, but, but I find that people who've been through war write about it very differently from people who haven't. And the feeling I get with Star Trek Discovery is they don't, they're writing about war, but they really haven't lived it. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But if you watch an episode of Twilight Zone called uh, The Purple Testament, that's one of the best things ever written about war by anybody. And that was Rod Serling write about, writing about his experiences in World War II. And it really, I think, presents what war is like very, very clearly. Uh, so anyway, so that's some of it. Uh, but that's my feeling about the Orville. Amiable, affable. Some of the jokes are funny. Not all. But, um, and Star Trek Discovery, we'll see. But that's it for now. Um, thanks, everybody. Subscribe to the Mr. Sci-Fi channel. Uh, very soon I'll be doing my, my, my piece on uh, Blade Runner 2049, which I found very interesting. And, uh, and we'll be releasing more of Space Command very, very soon and talking about that. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Bye, guys.